Well, thank you all very much, in particular to Councillor Baldacci for the nomination and the very kind and gracious words, and for Councillor Neely's words as well. I have no doubt that I'll be coming to you for advice, both as a counselor and as a father, because you've both been through that already. So I appreciate it very much. I want to say thank you to uh, all of my fellow counselors for the trust and faith you've placed on me, in, in me. This is a great honor and a, a responsibility that I, I do not take it lightly as we move into the new year together. In a time when Washington, D.C. is crippled by partisan gridlock and Augusta passes one burden after another down to us, it is worth remembering that every single person in this room, whether you're a citizen, past counselor, current counselor, member of city staff, we're all united by one thing, which is that we all want what is best for Bangor. At times we may disagree, but we're all here this morning because we believe that Bangor's best days are ahead of her and that our efforts over the next year can and will make a positive difference to our community. So what do we find when we take an objective look at Bangor today? We see one of the best libraries in the country, trails, parks, the city forest, top quality healthcare facilities. We have a great local theater that brings in top quality talent right across the street from a children's museum. We have Robinson Ballet and Bangor Ballet, our very own symphony orchestra and the Bangor Band. We have a great art museum right across the street from this building. Each August, we host the American Folk Festival and the only event, the only sporting event in Maine to be broadcast nationally each year, the Senior League World Series. We see a community that both Forbes Magazine and AARP have rated as one of the top communities in the entire country to retire. International accounting firm KPMG has ranked Bangor seventh in the country among small cities for most favorable tax climates for businesses. We have a school system that is one of the best in the state. There's a new vibrancy in Bangor that we see in our downtown area, along the waterfront, and in the arena. I and other counselors and former counselors travel all around the state and everywhere we hear from people, what's in the water in Bangor? What are you guys doing? Because you're really on the move in Bangor. From waterfront concerts to Kabang, to the many events our Convention and Visitors Bureau puts together each year, there are incredible opportunities for Bangor citizens that did not exist in years past. In any, on any given evening in Bangor, you can go out downtown and see live music at half a dozen or more places, visit museums, shop at eclectic stores, and dine at wonderful restaurants. We're also an hour from Acadia, an hour from Baxter State Park. There's clean water in the taps, things we take for granted like reasonable housing prices. Bangor is a great place to live, and there's lots of reasons to be optim optimistic today. That said, it's time. This is the year for us as a community to stop saying, haven't we come so far? and instead start saying, what type of community do we want to become? As we work to answer that, type, that question, what type of community we want to become, there are going to be challenges. Earlier this year, I did a survey of 500 area residents about their opinions and perspectives about the state of things in Bangor today. People are rightfully proud to live in Bangor and generally pretty happy to be living here. But there are concerns, number one of which is about drugs and crime in our neighborhoods and in our city. What I want to say to everyone out there who is concerned is that we are listening. This council gets it. Over the past two years, and not just this council, but we have former councilors Weston, Palmer, Gratwick with us, we have taken a proactive look at drugs and crime in our communities. We reacted proactively when bath salts first appeared. This has been mostly positive, but when you react proactively and you become known as the community that's taking its drug problem seriously, you're still known as a community with a drug problem. So perceptions and realities of drugs and crime in our community persist. Two, we added a downtown walking beat police officer. I've heard from many people associated with a downtown that this has had a positive effect and people feel safer and that downtown is more welcoming. Three, with the cooperation of several area businesses, we ban the use and sale of a variety of synthetic drugs, another reason why our downtown is seeing its image improved. Four, citizens with the cooperation of city staff, the police department and others, and counselors have formed east side and west side neighborhood watches, bringing people together to address issues in our neighborhoods. And five, we've taken a hard line with vacant and unsafe properties, 
and landlords who do not properly screen tenants, and we can point to several specific spots around the city that have improved dramatically as a result of these actions. These actions are all starting to make a difference. They will continue to make a difference. Our police chief and his force are tackling the problem head on, and I have full confidence that we are turning the tide on Bangor's drug problems and the crime associated with it. The message today is we hear you. Among other challenges for us, the median income in Bangor is $37,700, $10,000 less than the state average, $15,000 less than the national average. Growing our economy and attracting businesses with good career-oriented jobs must be a priority for all of us. We must also support our existing entrepreneurs in Bangor as well as attract new ones. Whether you're large or small, old or new, downtown, Union Street, Broadway, Bangor Mall area, wherever it is, the city of Bangor is happy to have you doing business in Bangor and we want to be a partner in helping you to be successful. We must also do a better job at telling our story. For years there's been a notion that Bangor is the end of the line. Many people still have this idea, including some in our own community, but we're not the end of the line. We're the center of Maine and the hub of business culture and services for a vast region that stretches to the east, north, and west. We find ourselves at the midpoint between Montreal, Quebec, Halifax, and St. John, New Brunswick, and 50% of the people who live in Canada live within a 10 hours drive of Bangor, Maine. People are coming down from the county and up from Portland to experience all that Bangor has to offer, and we should be projecting a more positive image of our community. No doubt one of our biggest challenges over the coming year and likely over the coming decade is how to provide optimal municipal services with declining revenues and increasing federal and state mandates. Multiple levels of government are expensive and oftentimes inefficient. There's a lot of talk about innovation in our region. I think that's great. Let's start with municipal government. Let's not just ask questions about whether we can do, afford to do things and how we'll pay for it, and instead ask, can we do things more efficiently with the resources we have? Technology is revolutionizing industries around the world. Why not local government too? Imagine mapping crime data to have a view on where the most troubled spots are around the community, or incidents with pedestrians, or traffic incidents in various intersections. Anecdotally, we all know where the troubled spots are around Bangor, but what about tracking these? Data will help us better understand our problems, help us shine a light on successes, and bring accountability where needed. Let's say one street, for example, has 120 calls or to the police department in a year, and then through increased patrols, maybe better lighting, increased communication with landlord and residents, the number goes down to 40 the next year. Six, that's a success story we can tout and we can isolate and identify what actions seem to make a difference in using in other neighborhoods. Or maybe the numbers go in the opposite direction. That would be a red flag and cause for concern. Imagine texting a photo of a downed limb, a broken streetlight, or a crosswalk in need of repair to a dedicated city number and getting a response, a tracking number, and a follow-up when the issue is resolved. Or if you don't want to text, a phone number that you can call, get a response immediately or within 24 hours, and another contact when the issue is resolved. Imagine a vehicle tracking device for snowplows and other city vehicles can load its data. We can identify more efficient routes, identify what streets are cleared and what are not in the winter. Imagine trash cans along the waterfront and in downtown that can alert public works when they're full. It's not a fantasy. The technology is there and we can have it in Bangor and the savings from increased efficiencies can pay for it and then some. We nine counselors must be united in seeking out and maintaining effective partnerships with our surrounding communities and with the state of Maine. The city of Bangor generates $1.2 billion in sales tax revenue in, in sales each year for the state of Maine. Statutory regulation says we should receive $5 million in municipal reven revenue sharing each year. But despite these statutory requirements, the state of Maine only allotted us $2.1 million last year. A policy that discourages revenue sharing, disincentivizes cities and towns like Bangor from doing economic development work, and breaks the partnership that should exist between the state and its cities and towns. The people of Bangor have been asked to invest in many things over the last decade. They expect a return on that investment. I have no doubt that this return will come and is already coming 
through increased through property taxes from new development, various other sources, but a portion of sales tax revenue is meant to stay in the community where it was generated. Last year, Augusta slashed our percentage and they're planning to do it again this year. I will fight tooth and nail on this and I hope my fellow counselors and leaders from communities around us will do the same. Bangor cannot bear the burdens of an entire region. Augusta has poached revenue from us that is meant for cities and towns for education and infrastructure. It has been choking off our mental health care center, Dorothea Dix, an issue that Councillor Baldacci and Councillor Durgan, among others, have been working on diligently. The closure or the reduction in service at Dorothea Dix is already having human consequences, not to mention the strain on our police, fire, EMS, and hospital personnel. The state has created programs that local taxpayers are mandated to fund, but with little control over how to administer them. For example, an issue that Council Chair Weston, who's with us today, has been working on or worked on when he was here is general assistance, a state mandated program. State mandated program to provide service, but we're not given any control over who can receive general assistance, such as instituting minimum residency requirements. Bangor currently has 1,500 slots for methadone treatment, 1,500. The next closest in the state is Portland at just 500. The only community north of Waterville that has methadone clinics is Callis with just 300 licenses. The city of Bangor cannot take care of everyone. It's not that we don't want to or that we don't believe in helping people, but our public services, including public safety, are already stretched to the limit. Any federal or state mandated programs should have federal or state funding attached to them if we're gonna carry them out at the local level. We want to cooperate with the state to find better ways of doing things. But a partnership where one side takes what it wants from the other while increasing its mandates and undermining our local control is not much of a partnership at all. These issues associated with mental illness, addiction, hunger, and poverty are incredibly complex and will be challenging for us as a group and for our staff to work through. Let us all remember that we represent all the members of our community, including the ones who never make it to a meeting, who are struggling to feed their families, and who are having trouble to make ends meet, who may be out of a job. During our own challenging budget times, it would be easy to forget these folks and to ignore the complicated realities we face. But in the words of a Franciscan blessing, let us all be blessed with discomfort at easy answers and half-truths, and may we be blessed with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference. How will we mark success this year? Each counselor will answer that in a different way. For me, my wife is in the audience today. Next month, as Counselor Baldacci noted, we'll be having our first child. I want to say thank you to her and to all the people who support these nine counselors. I could not be here without her support, and I think everybody knows at times and meetings I sit here and I just, honestly, I just want to go home to be with Mallory, and I'm sure that feeling is just going to be stronger once this baby comes. But at the same time, my wife and this baby are the reasons why I do this work, and people like her are the reasons why all of us are here today. If our son can grow up in a safe, healthy community with good schools, his mother and I can send him outside and say, just come home when the street lights come on. And if he can go away if he wants and then come back if he wants to start a career in his family of his own, then to me, our work here this year will have been a success. So thank you again to my fellow counselors, to everyone who's in attendance today, watching at home, watching on the computer, to Counselor Durgan for leading us with grace and class over the past year to the city manager and to all the city staff here's to a great year ahead thank you very much and we'll be back at 7:30 tonight <laughs>